Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and with the Curse of the Vampire Coast DLC for Total War Warhammer 2 coming out later this week, I thought I'd put together a bit of a review. Full disclosure, Creative Assembly did give me an early access key to the DLC, and with that said, there's nothing stopping me from picking the thing apart, as I've done in the past, and as I'm about to do over the next, say, 10 or 15 minutes. If you're interested in getting the DLC for yourself and you haven't yet, consider using my Humble Bundle affiliate link to support the channel and charity as you do. Links will be in the description down below and under the eye at the top right corner of the screen. With all that said, let's get cracking. Fortune favors the infamous. First things first, to clarify, this review looks only at the Curse of the Vampire Coast DLC. I'll consider it as an add-on for Total War Warhammer 2 primarily, and only after that should we even think about it as an add-on to the Mortal Empires campaign that's only available to owners of both Total War Warhammer 2 and 1. This conversation also doesn't include the free content being released at the same time, the new Dark Elf Legendary Lord, Lokir Felhart. That's a completely separate freebie and out of the scope of this DLC review. So what does this new DLC include? Well, it adds an entirely new race, the Vampire Coast, and for them it adds four entirely new factions, each with their own unique legendary lords. This means four new starting positions, four new skill trees, and more for their agents, and a plethora of new heroes to use in single and multiplayer, each with their own skills, stats, and approaches. The race, as a whole, has a completely new roster, and some of the factions have their unique flair of personal units, and we also see some shiny new mechanics. In talking about the most basic expectations, I'd say the DLC is right up there with Tomb Kings. That's where I think the current bar sits with Fantasy Total War DLC. When it comes to going above and beyond, there are some hits and misses. Like any regular broadside, I suppose. Let's dive in. Basic requirement number one, we see a completely new roster which is full of flavor, magnificent models, terrific textures, and astounding animations. The cheesy alliterations just write themselves, but outside of issues with the base game from a technical perspective, like models clipping and janky animations at times, the roster from lords to cannon fodder to beasts to actual cannons all shine bright like pirate booty. The Necrofex Colossus is a joy to watch, even as it tiptoes and hobbles over and fires at point-blank range. Uh, the deck droppers are hilarious and functional. The animated hulks are great showcases of creative splicing, and the giant enemy crabs have no weak points when it comes to their visual execution. There's a good bit of new abilities being added for units as well. Extra powder makes gunpowder units more potent at the start of the battle, and there are some supporting characters that can help keep ammunition up so extra powder stays active. It's a nice sort of combination. Uh, Charmed is for the Sirens. It allows them to reduce enemy melee attack, and uh, otherwise the roster itself feels very much themed rather than a catch-all generic roster. It gives me Napoleonic vibes. Nothing is perfect in life though, and as great as the roster is, I do feel like there were a couple of misses. Uh, giving Luther Harkin nothing but a Death Shriek Terrorgeist as a mount option feels like a missed opportunity, and it's quite unfortunate that Aranessa Saltspite's living Sartosan units basically become useless in her mid to late game, and she has no high tier Sartosan units. Feels like another missed opportunity to make her faction really stand out. She should have more mortals in there. They shouldn't be yelling for Sigmar, though again, that's probably just a temporary voice line that's being swapped out. But uh, I just feel like some more life could have been brought into the faction, separating them from the other actual undead Vampire Coast factions. Apart from that, the same goes for Salostra Dyerfin. Apart from a small number of things, she doesn't really feel like Vampire Bretonia for very long. Scurvy Dogs are also just dire wolves, and Fell Bats are just Fell Bats, and it's not the end of the world, especially considering that it is in fact a vampire faction, but I feel the need to point out the few reused assets and maybe some places where there could have been a bit of experimentation or changing being done. So while the core roster is quite fantastic, the unique units on a per faction basis fall a little short of what I'd hoped. This is furthered by the skill trees across all four lords being largely generic with a unique line here and there. While that's how it's always been done, and makes sense from that perspective, it does feel like yet another missed opportunity to make the factions feel a bit more different, especially where it makes sense. Even if the skills had thematic names for the same results, even though that'd be superficial, be a nice way to further differentiate some very different factions. Like I said, one is mortal, one is Bretonian, two of them are related to the OG vampires, but it doesn't really feel that way at times. I am glad that Solastra has access to an ethereal paladin, and the agents do feel right for the faction across the board, with options to increase ranged output, bring in magical support, or bring in a freaky anti-infantry melee monster. 
It would have been nice if some of the actions had been more pirate themed though. We've got digging for treasure and establishing pirate coves, but maybe all abilities are more likely to succeed at sea or for coastal provinces. Maybe an option to raid trade routes uh, as literal pirates. Things could have been done here. So again, maybe just a bit of a missed opportunity to make the entire faction and the entire race, I should say as a whole, stand out from others when it comes to their agent actions. Basic requirement number two, new campaign mechanics. And they're quite plentiful. Pirate coves are a very clever tool that can be used to make money or gain infamy without having to manage a settlement or worry about the repercussions of owning it. If you win a battle over a settlement or you use the appropriate agent action for a tremendous amount of cash, you can establish a pirate cove in a city, siphoning a percentage of its income and earning infamy as well. This cove stays there even when a settlement changes hands until it's burned down. It's a very cool option, it fits the theme and it facilitates a bit of role playing while also being the mechanically wise choice in many situations. You can use it to, for example, make money from far off cities without actually engaging in war, or you can establish pirate coves to soften up the local resolve, spreading vampiric corruption to prepare the land for your eventual conquest, saving you the trouble of public order issues and causing the enemy the trouble of attrition. There's a lot of decision-making going on over here. For example, do you siphon off of trade wealth or do you siphon off of local income or do you just gain infamy or do you try to spread vampiric corruption it's a nice little bit of depth it's a nice new mechanic i'm a big fan of it honestly it's a solid addition and it really opens up the approaches in a variety of wonderful ways it's a, it's a definite hit this one now the idea of infamy is great it matches the pirate theme quite well unfortunately in some ways it feels like just another bar that you have to fill in order to win so Rather than being something you can do, it's something you have to do anyway, and you don't really have to go out of your way for it either. You gain infamy by doing the typical Total War things, winning battles, completing missions, and choosing one option over the other at times. I do like that spending infamy gives you access to legendary admirals, and I wish it was a more integral part of the DLC as a piece of currency or a tool to be used for other purposes. Maybe a form of mercenary recruitment or the currency needed to upgrade the flagship something to add more functionality. Next up are the treasure maps, a fun thematic distraction from the regular gameplay cycle of a Total War campaign. All your lords and heroes can dig for treasure, and treasure maps simply give clues as to where you should be digging for said treasure. A nice extra thing to do to get extra advantages, and some of the treasure maps can be assigned to characters in order to get certain advantages. I do wish they were maybe a bit more long-winded, but that's probably just me. I do like a good puzzle like some of the ridiculous ones you get when searching ruins, but more on that in a bit. One major flub as far as new mechanics are concerned is that of Aminar. The main driving force of the Vampire Coast storyline is ironically quite dry, only surfacing occasionally to damage the buildings in a settlement, and it's frankly just annoying to have your settlement randomly picked. It forces you to divert resources in a quick bid to repair the damage done. There is surely room for something more compelling here, and it's a little disappointing that it's as plain as this. The most interesting new addition, though I hesitate to call it new rather than putting it in the next category of evolving mechanics, is actually my favorite. The Legendary Lord's ship basically acts as a mobile command center, allowing you to move around like a horde faction using population surplus and money to build structures that in turn provide local recruitment, wealth, corruption, and other functions. Outside of that, you're also able to conquer settlements like a regular empire, and build settlements like any other faction would, with access to landmark buildings, resource buildings, and also the regular suite of buildings that can be built on the ship. All except for the harpoon, I suppose. The reason why I find this most interesting is because it opens up options without being superfluous or forced on the player as an old mechanic under a new name. My Noctilus One City Challenge campaign was born out of testing if the faction could be played in two vastly different ways. With this Noctilus campaign and the Let's Play that I've got on the channel, what I'm doing is just going out with Noctilus, I just have his home city, and we're just going to recruit the legendary admirals and see if a viable horde faction can be built off of the pirate coves and raiding and just, you know, living a pirate's life as it were. Like I said though, I do hesitate to call it new because it is more an evolution or amalgamation of existing mechanics, though it does add a great deal of replayability. Now this does bring us to basic requirement number three, which is evolving core mechanics. Regiments of Renown have a bit of a facelift here. Rather than unlocking them based on rank, you unlock them by chasing after the pieces of eight. There are, as the name suggests, eight of them. And they are just armies that need to be defeated in order to unlock the associated Regiment of Renown. 
While I like the thinking behind this, it forces you to go out to sea more often than you might otherwise, and it forces you to engage against armies of varying threat levels, it unfortunately feels like a rehash of the Books of Nagash. And while the Books of Nagash were the driving force of the campaign for the Tomb Kings, and it was an interesting way to go about it, the Pieces of Eight have been relegated to providing regiments of renown. With that said, I do like this as a method of obtaining these regiments. It makes for a more compelling approach than simply having a general reach a certain level. And it's kind of funny chasing these fleets around in the hopes of getting a juicy regiment. Another nicely improved mechanic is that of the encounters at sea. While it's not the case every time, sometimes you'll have an actual encounter at sea. That is to say, somebody will have beaten you to the punch, and now you either opt to engage them in battle for a bigger reward, or wait for them to finish plundering before you go in for smaller rewards because you are far too cowardly a pirate. I especially like this because now, rather than simply going out of your way to pick up some cash en route, you actually have to bring a well-rounded army to face off against any potential threat. This finally add some much needed dimension to the encounters at sea. They were fun at first, they very quickly started to become rather shallow, but now here with this new addition, they once again regain some of their depth and interest. Now, on the topic of added dimension, ruins can be searched, as they used to be able to before, but now they trigger these sometimes vaguely written puzzles. Guessing or deducing the answer correctly gives you the rewards that the ruin might hold, and while they are sometimes maybe a little frustratingly confusing, I do quite enjoy these kinds of visual riddles, and uh, I personally think it's quite a nice evolution, as far as I'm concerned, again. Rather than randomly guessing from just some sentences, you have to make a logical deduction. Rather than randomly guessing a sentence, which is always the wrong one, as happens to be the case with me, you can just spend some time, think about your answer, and because it's a logical deduction, getting it wrong means a mistake was made. I like it. It's actual thinking being applied here. You just have to apply yourself. Um, apart from that, offices, I guess, are worth a brief mention. They exist. They provide different buffs, and you can assign them based on certain criteria. Okay, moving on. The new magical lore is worth mentioning as well. The lore of the deeps is built from scratch by Creative Assembly, and it's perhaps got some of the most beautiful spells. Functionally, it bolsters the faction in some specific ways, such as spells that imbue magical missile damage and accuracy buffs, or spells that slow the enemy down so they can be shot to shreds, and then there are giant ghost ships that broadside the battlefield. All in all, a well-rounded thematic set of spells that I feel are pretty powerful, but not too powerful, and they do set the faction apart. And I think the tech tree is actually worth an honorable mention as well. It's categorized in an interesting way, making a two-step process available for any one of these categories. Basically, you pick one that unlocks the whole segment, and then you can tailor your approach, pick which research makes most sense for your approach, and how much time you're willing to invest at which point in time of your campaign, and there you go. You make your choices. I like it. One of my biggest annoyances with the DLC, apart from the skill trees being too similar and Aminar, you know, falling flat, is that two of the factions basically start in mirror positions off the coast of Ulthuan, and their objectives force them against the High Elves right at the beginning. Like, Sartosa could go south to fight the Tomb Kings and Bretonians at the beginning, but you have to deal with Ivress at the beginning, and Lothurn is likely to go to war with you. Similarly, the Dreadfleet could go over to fight the Dark Elves or maybe invade Lustria, but instead they're dealing with Kalidor and Lothurn. It feels like it creates an annoyingly similar start for these two factions when it could very easily have been changed. Send one south, send one to the Dark Elves, send something somewhere else. I mean, it doesn't help that my last campaign Let's Play was a Hellebron fight against the High Elves campaign, but I feel like something should have been done here so there was some more variety in starting positions, at least for the regular campaign. Now, at least Solastra is dealing with Skeggy at first, but even her unique opera house at Lothurn will have her wanting to get there before the other vampires do. Now, after the initial hump, though, the world becomes your oyster, and the starts are interesting across the board. A good variety of enemies to fight, a good variety of approaches, and I like it. Just a little bit of a mistake with the opening act, I would say. When it comes to an overall judgment, many of you know already that I dislike numerical scores. They're typically irrelevant, they're plucked out of nowhere, and they lead to comparisons that don't make sense. I hate arbitrary judgments. What matters instead is the enjoyability factor of the piece. The Curse of the Vampire Coast adds four new factions, a new magical lore, and a new roster with sparing amounts of reused assets from older factions. Visually, the game remains stunning, and the audio work remains fantastic. 
there are a couple of misses as far as the skill trees, Aminar, faction separation, those things are concerned. And while at times I feel like the envelope could have been pushed just a little bit more, that's not to say that it wasn't already being pushed quite a bit. Compared to the Tomb Kings, we're not seeing as many radical changes to core mechanics such as army limits or unit count limits, but we are seeing the evolution and amalgamation of old ones to create interesting new playstyles. With that said, pirate coves are quite compelling, and as long as you want to try something different, you'll get some serious mileage out of the new addition. The changes to ruin searching and encounters at sea are quite big, and the option to play any of the four new factions in two completely different ways is fantastic. Naturally, it all boils down to this. Do you want to play as a pirate vampire faction that has sea creatures and gunners and artillery for days with some interesting constructs, a new magical lore, and a unique way to play the campaign? Do you want to field gun lines and fodder front lines alongside giant crabs in multiplayer? If so, then this certainly delivers. If not, then, you know, maybe skip it or wait for a post-launch sale. It is on sale right now, I will say. It might be a good time to pick it up if you're even remotely interested. In my opinion, Curse of the Vampire Coast will add many, many, many more hours of playtime to the game for a fair price, and as a result of that, it gets a loud aye aye captain from me. I hope you guys enjoyed this review of the Curse of the Vampire Coast, and I hope it outlines some of what makes it unique, while also pointing out where I think it could have been a bit better. Now it's up to you to decide whether the DLC is worth it in your eyes or not. For more strategy gaming content, make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit that bell for notifications. And a big thanks to all of my patrons and channel members for keeping things afloat on this boat. And a big thanks to you, of course, for watching. Till next time, cheers.